Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Triforce. Uh, Sips, how you yeah. doing? Oh, just Ooh. great. Yeah, thanks for asking. Mm. How are you doing? Good. P Flax, how are you doing? Hello. I'm coming at you live from the Isle of Sheppey. Oh, where? where is where is that? It is um, North Kent. Yeah, oh, there's a little. So it's one of those urban islands that's not actually like isolated at all. It's no. basically just a normal town. It's a um, no. It's, I mean, it's it's very very. It's it's odd because you have to cross a very large Scandinavian looking bridge to get here. I don't know if there are other bridges. And then it is. I mean, if you look on a map, it is like a a, sl- a chunk of land that's completely separated by by water. Um, I believe, but it's yeah, it is yeah. It's oddly yeah. industrial on the bit that you come in from because of all the docks <laughs> and stuff around here. So you yeah. you come over this bridge and it's just there's a vast Morrison's. Uh, sort of uh, warehouse, what do they call it, distribution center. It's enormous. And then there's like a huge factory of some kind. And there's like a massive thing with all lights and it looks like a power thing and there's power lines everywhere. And then we drove for half an hour. We went past a prison, huge prison. Nice. And then we're in the like countryside. Alcatraz. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And then, but, and then, um, and now we're, uh, we're in the middle of the countryside and I can see Whitstable with my binoculars um, and we're literally in the middle of a huge field. Uh, there's a, a few houses, and then there's just fields, fields, fields in all directions for miles around. So it's very, very quiet, very peaceful. Um, right. Sheep Island is what it comes from, the old English. Ah. Sheppy, sheep, sheepy Island. Sheepy yeah. Island. A plentiful source of fossils. Ooh. So it's it's like, um, it's like, basically, I don't know whether it is an island, but we it's got like a river sort of really blocking it so it's this large river isn't it or something it's, it's it doesn't feel like a true no. kind of are you don't show me is it so close to the coast and so close to everything else you could probably swim across yes you could swim but, across but i mean i, I suppose river. in some technical sense it is they call yeah. it the, an isle but uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's definitely not it's not off the coast but I'm sure the people that live here call themselves islanders. But also it's like the psychology, right, of going away somewhere like that. It feels like you've you've isolated yourself or you've like, you know, like like Jersey, you know. It always feels to me like even though it's very British, very I'm still connected to everything, I'm just away from the world. So can you can you trick yourself? Where is the family, by the way? I was expecting them to are they silently listening in the background? <laughs> no. It's it's me and Mrs. F and the girls, and then we've also brought my mum right. because uh, you know she's on a. She's That's on a good own. shout, isn't it? Like you bring along a mother-in-law or or somebody, and then it just like you can say like, oh hey, I just need to go to the store, and then you can just like go to the pub all afternoon because well you know, yeah, you you think people to cover. so, you think so, but because of because of COVID, it's been really hard to find uh, a place to to book. So we were only able to get one place for two days. We got this place for two days, so. We're essentially, we drove down on Monday to the South Coast in an area called, oh Christ, it was yesterday and I've already forgotten it. It was that good. It was near yeah. Rye. It was quite near Rye. It was Rye Harbour. Rye okay. is another very historic town. So what, you booked two different places? And we had stayed to. in one yeah. for a couple of days and another for a couple of days. Why it is. is it so like that? Because because it's just hard to get a booking. It's hard to find places because of COVID. A lot of it. Yeah. Places some places down. just aren't open and then some places are just booked up because people yeah. need to Because there's away. less places. People are people are booking up what they can get. Like with with lockdown and stuff, you gotta you gotta think as well. Like I we my fan like we live in a house. So it's not too bad. There's like a downstairs and an upstairs. So during lockdown, like I've got the garage, like everybody can disperse around the house and have right. space to themselves and it's fine, right? Like it's not it's not too bad. But like a lot of people will live in flats, smaller accommodation, you know, they might have like you know, a couple and like one child, sometimes a couple and, and multiple children living like in a smaller a flat or something like that. Holy crap! Can you imagine being locked down for as long as everybody was locked down There's for? There's just nowhere to go. Yeah, yeah. Would, just be- literally, just you know, like crammed in like sardines. Because the thing is, if you have a living accommodation like that, you're more likely to just go out a lot, right? You probably eat out a lot more. You probably go. You're you're probably out all the time on the weekends, like with the kids and stuff. And that makes sense. But with lockdown not being able to do that, you can imagine that a lot of people are just like desperate to 
go and stay in some accommodation that's bigger and just, yeah. you know, air I, out I a mean, bit. I, and, I know people as well who it's not even their family that they're stuck in that situation with. It's like with a flatmate or oh, yeah, yeah. something like that. So it's, it's not even someone that you could really – like. I feel like you can forgive family a lot. Yeah. But – other people, they're, they're, the limit for acceptance and forgiveness is far, far lower. You know, you're yeah. sort of you're going to lose your uh, your mind with them a lot, a lot quicker. Um, yeah, for sure. Like, and I mean, it, it feels to me almost like there was no, you know, winter is a kind of time when everyone's sort of stuck inside anyway because it's raining and it's cold and it's miserable. And sure, oh, you can go out occasionally. Fuck, this but... week has been like just a testament to that. Fuck, it's like a hurricane over here every goddamn day. Like, and and so we just got onto the end of that sort of winter, you know february march period when we were all sort of put into the lockdown the first time so it feels like everyone was kind of ready and they were just starting to go out again and kind of do stuff and then at least at least that's what it's like here a little bit i, I guess it does get pretty miserable for the winter months you know yeah. it's something we we always complain about a lot but we sort of we sort of it's long enough between summer and winter for us to forget just how bad it was and how dark it is you know and like yeah getting up at sort of eight in the morning and it's dark and then go to you know they're getting home at like five and it's dark and it's like geez you know but um, but we get we have it great compared to scandinavia or canada i'm sure t- sips like you know yeah i was up, just talking to my aunt yeah. yesterday and it's like three degrees there she lives she lives alone um and she lives she lives in montreal and it's they're they're kind of locked down again not as bad as like a while back but um, you know, like the cases are rising and they're, they're telling people to, to not go out as much and blah, blah, blah. And so with the weather yeah. being like it is, she, her, her normal thing was when she wanted to, you know, like meet up with people, she'd meet up with her friends and just go for like a walk, like a distanced walk or whatever. But she can't really do that now because it's so cold outside. <laughs> yeah. So there's just nothing, nothing really for her to do. So I think she just Skypes like anybody who will Skype with her. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> Well, I like that. Yesterday we went to um, – because we, we, we left the – first because you know the way they have a checkout and a check-in time in all these places? The checkout time in our first house was 10 a.m. And the check-in, time, the check-in time at the next place was 4 p.m. So we had Man. six hours to waste. Now, there's five of us in our car with the dog in the boot and a week's worth of luggage for all yeah. and food that we brought with us because it's quite remote. You know, there's, there's things you need. And so the, the car was absolutely jammed full – and we had to yeah. waste six hours. So we went oh, to, man. we were so desperate. We went to Dungeness because my oh, mum had okay. never been there. And we'd, I'd been there before with, with Mrs. F, but um, the kids hadn't seen it in a long time. And Dungeness is a very strange place because even though it is definitely connected to land, it feels like you're in another, so it feels like another dimension, like you stepped through some portal. So you drive down a series of very long winding sort of roads and then some very straight roads and it's right on the coast and it's a very, very deep um, rocky beach with sort of uh, thick grass, swampy heath around it. And then there's just all these houses and they're all different and they all look like some weird artist's residence or an abandoned ghost house. Like that's pretty much what all the houses look like. Right. on the Dungeness yeah. estate. And it's very strange. They're all quite distant from each other. Some of them are so small that you think it must be like a single person could stay in there for a few nights before they lost their mind, like a cell of some kind. And then and then there's two massive lighthouses and a cafe and a pub. And then there's this huge Dungeness power station, the nuclear power station, looming over everything. It's, it's so strange. And if that wasn't weird enough, we got there and the rain was coming down so hard that I could barely see. We pull up, the rain breaks for like just long enough for everybody to run inside. And we had to get the dog because she's in the boot. So when I went to get the dog out of the boot, it started hailing horizontally. Like it's yeah. just, it's like a hail of machine gun fire coming in from, from the coast. And the, the hail is just shooting into the car and filling up the boot. And the dog is freaking out. And I'm trying to put the collar on her. And Mrs. F is like, just get the car out of So I slammed the boot door. I was like, you go inside. I'm staying in the car. Like, I completely <laughs> lost my mind and just sat and sulked in the car for a bit. And while I was in there just thinking this is the worst holiday ever, the sun magically came out. And I got out and I got the dog on her collar and I took her into the cafe. But I was completely soaked through. I mean, as if I'd been through a car wash level of soap. My shoes were squelching. And that was at 10.30 in the morning. So obviously we couldn't check in till 4.00. So I was walking around squelching everywhere all day. 
it's been miserable. I'm not going to lie. It's been a crap holiday so far. Oh, man. That sounds like every British childhood holiday I had yep. from the ages of four through to, you know, 15. I think, honestly, my, my parents had been through the same thing and realized that English holidays were just kind of drab and miserable. Like, you, you, if you were, if you were unlucky, you just got a shitty, miserable, bad weather week, even in summer. Yeah, and it was just like being trapped with with the family. Uh, if you might as well have been at home, and there was just it was just not. I mean, I remember we went to Norfolk a couple of times, and it was it was it was pretty miserable. I mean, me and my brother would play Magic the Gathering or something like this, you know, to try and keep ourselves entertained. And, right. But but after a while, my parents were just like, "Yeah, we're going to go on holiday less, but we're going to go." somewhere abroad right <laughs> i mean so it was like instead of going away every year we'd go away every other year to like a greek island or something i mean we do for like us it was actually... either it was either camping or driving somewhere so fucking far away that it just took days to drive there right. like yeah m- multiple days of like you know eight nine hour driving and it's and it was the worst oh my yeah. god I used it to was hate hot it. like it was the 80s you know, most cars didn't have like air conditioning or anything, and it was just like, ah, oh, geez, the worst. Fucking most just- of those types of shitty holidays that I went on with my dad, because he was um, back in the day, he was a scout sort of leader when he was in his twenties. Um, you know, back up in Derby, he was a big scout. He was part of the scout sort of group and right. had a lot of fun up in Derby because because it's kind of the the. Um, the Lake District, the Peak District, all around up there, uh, and so it's what compels varying. you to be a scout leader in your twenties. Exactly, that was what he was doing during his twenties, and he really enjoyed going out on the Peak District. When he had a right. lot of friends in it, and he stayed friends with them his whole life, really. Anyway, as a sort of scout master, I think he'd done his time. And when I was in the Scouts, he was one of the sort of rather than being a scout leader, he was kind of just a dad who was keen to get involved, right? Because you know, he remembered everything and had all of his, all of his, all of his kicks. He kept everything, you know. He kept this old knackered old tent that was clearly like 30 <laughs> years old when yeah. he got it um but it was this sort of heavy canvas tent with these really heavy metal poles and i feel like a lot of his idea of camping was driving up to a campsite and then pulling the tent out of the back of the car and literally putting it out there you know not carrying it any distance you know there was no that that was it. That was like part of it, right? And so it was this very kind of. There was no trekking into the wilderness to to camp. You know, you were camping in a campsite that had a, a toilet facility and a shower facility and a probably like a little chef next door or something like this. You know, and so it was kind of this. It was nice in a sense, but it was also kind of not quite what we were expecting because sometimes you know the the people were like, oh, we have to trek check some distance you know and trying to bring my dad's tent was was not doable i think even then it was like even sort of 20 30 years ago it was it was knackers <laughs> it, it was nice i will enjoy i will say like i and i did i did a lot of this stuff i mean you guys must have done the duke of edinburgh and the cadets and all this stuff where you went out and you went somewhere fucking miles away we did yeah we did um i was in I was in beavers and cubs. I don't know if you guys have the same system over yeah. there, but like, so cubs yeah. was, I, I probably, you, you move on from cubs to scouts at when you're like 10 or 11, I guess. So like, yeah, like fairly young. I was like pretty young, but I never went into scouts cause I just like, I didn't even really like cubs that much. So, so someone <laughs> always picks some arbitrary distance, like in the Brecon Beacons or somewhere completely on the other side of the country. And we go there for almost no reason. Yeah. And sure, it's like a beautiful place, but it's a long fucking way. Yeah. And, you, and you're often just camping in a field anyway. And so you, there's a field right next to where we were. Do you know what I mean? Like, but you had to go somewhere different. It was that psychology. Right? We had and, like, we had winter retreat and summer retreat. And so winter retreat, you stayed in like a big cabin because obviously you couldn't camp outside in a tent in this in the snow and stuff and everything was like dog sledding ice fishing like all like that sort of wintry outdoor <laughs> stuff and that, was, that was that was all right but like you're, you're penguin baiting you're, yeah, <laughs> you're, 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 you're sleeping in this massive sort of it was like it was like a like a like a barracks or like a dormitory or something right it had these bunk beds and stuff and like it was just Man, I don't know. I don't even know Get if they kids, do that it's time nowadays. For igloo like, building it, today. It, it was oh, like it God. was like six winter camp. Six Sounds men like hell. looking after like Canada. thirty kids. I don't know like how that. That's what it was. I don't know how that flies today. Like with with everything that goes on and stuff like that. I just don't know how 
anybody sends their their kids off on on those things unless you really no, know the it was six very, guys <laughs> it almost felt like imagine you, there that wasn't a thing it almost felt quite reckless anyway in a sense because you know you're out there with all these these kids who are kind of not the you know but but i guess you're just kind of scared straight often in these places because you know that like you're in the middle of a fucking wilderness area if you wandered off you know, you'd probably get eaten by a fucking... You'd probably be found savaged by badgers. No, you'd probably find like a main road in a fucking McDonald's actually in England. But, yeah. um, you know, it's 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 one of these things where it did feel kind of slightly risky, slightly unsafe doing these scout camps back in the day. I always just... I felt... I don't know. I was always scared. I was. I think I was always just scared the whole time that, that something would go wrong. I, I mean, I, I certainly think about when we... When I was in the cadets, I know you were as well, Lewis. We did uh, army camp, which I've mentioned before, which is where we went to an army base. I think it was near Minehead. And we uh, we had to do a 24-hour exercise. So we left at like dawn one day. We had to pack <laughs> it up sounds everything. Like a very, it's a very army thing. It was. Leaving at dawn. We leave at dawn. So we had to load up, at dawn. load up our Bergens, which are these huge rucksacks. And we were in uniform. Yes. And they gave us a, a, a Lee Enfield rifle with blank rounds. We had like five, five or 10 each. I think it was 10. The Enfield rifle. I know. This is how long, this is how old this story is. <laughs> no, I, they, they still Christ. use them. They still use them. I'm, I'm serious. It, it, they are really, really good target shooting rifles and they're cheap. And honestly, after World War II, we had so many of these things that they just, they were still in circulation for cadets and training and stuff. They're, it's still a good, good rifle anyway. We, okay. we went off um, and we had to march for a couple of miles and we had to be aware of ambushes and stuff like that. And then we sort of had to set up a perimeter and post sentries. And then we had to make our tents and have some rations. And then we woke up the next morning, we had breakfast, took down the tents, packed everything up, repacked all our bags while still maintaining, you know, a, a tactical uh, awareness of the, the surroundings. And there were older lads, sixth formers and, and suspicious friends of the sixth formers who were mysteriously on this army camp as well. That's that's something you wouldn't get these days. It's people who were not associated with the school, but were mates of people who would just come along. So it was weird because we go on this <laughs> army camp, <laughs> and there was so like weird. some of their mates would just come along in full army gear, and they were all. I mean, no, none of them were in the army or had been in the army. They were just ex pupils who basically had never moved on from being in school and were somehow still friends with people who were at the school. Or whatever. It was bizarre. You did get that. You did get that a bit, didn't you? Like yeah. people who were way too old for something like 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 cadets or scouts or had moved or but but stuck around kind of after they'd supposed to have left. Yeah. You know? And they just because they, still they like the that school. position of power. There's this funny hierarchy, right, where you go like up through the different school groups and you sort of get promoted to the head boy or whatever of your primary school and then suddenly you're a year seven and you're a chump you're a you're a no one you know and then you sort of make your way back up the hierarchy again and they'd obviously made their way up the hierarchy to colonel or whatever it was in the drum corps and they just can't they can't possibly leave i think they they understand this is as good as it's because if they went into the territorial army or they went into another cadet group they'd be the lowest level again but because they, they they they're holding on to that fucking artificial i remember those those kind of there were a couple of people like that who were sort of very highly ranked in those groups right but in the rest of the school and in the rest of the world they, <laughs> they were kind of a nobody yeah and so they were obsessed with this kind of idea of holding on to this power that they had in these groups and they they did boss people around and they enjoyed like kind of it, it's power it's, it's this weird corrupting thing you know you think it won't like change you but it definitely does. And you have Even to though it's so, just like, the power of, of being one of the older boys in a school and then also yeah. not being at the school and you can smoke and drink and talk about going to the pub and everyone's like, wow, he's going to the pub. It's like, well, yeah, because he's like in his, he's like 19 or in his early 20s, still hanging around with all the kids from school. What? Why aren't I more suspicious of these people? You know what I mean? It's quite, it's, but the, back then it wasn't a problem. It is, and you could see, you could see it being quite addicting though, like to, to be like, to have people listen to you yeah. and, you know, actually have useful things for you to, you know, almost like an, being an educator suddenly, like you're able to like teach these kids how to like put up their tent or, you know, survive in the wilderness. And I don't know, sort of semi, semi manly sort of feeling useful stuff. But these kids, certainly the kid in my cadets were not the manliest you know, manliest men type type folks. Yeah. They were, the, they were kind of like the people that you see in British Army movies, though. They were kind of slightly, they spoke properly. They weren't like 
muscly, big, scary Ross Kemp guys that you see in the SAS, you know, like we're, yeah, we're the actual British army, but we're led by, hello, yes, my name's <laughs> Douglas. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be your colonel for today. Uh, so we're going to send you into France. Uh, they've, the bloody uh, Nazis have taken over a little town there called Calais. Uh, I went on holiday with my family there a couple of times, lovely place, but those bloody Nazis have taken it. <laughs> so you, Ross Kemp, and you, Big Mike, you're going to fucking, I mean, you're going to take those, <laughs> you're going to take those blighters by, by shock. That's right. You're going to shoot them, take them over, uh, take Calais back for the good jolly old Brits. And then we and me and my family go on holiday there once again. Uh, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's, that's the kind of, they were oddly now today, the people that I met in cadets who were pencil, in the army, pencil were mustache, a little bit like that. Gentlemen. See, but the, the guys that I had were not like that. The guys I had were oh, really? not like that because when I went to university subsequently, I, I got a summer job working in a warehouse. It was a pharmaceuticals warehouse and it served some small chemists in the, the Bournemouth and Pool area. And what would happen is they would give us their orders for, you know, we need uh, 10 sanitary towel packs and we need some uh, corn ointment and we need uh, some, some smelly foot inserts for shoes and we need uh, 10 boxes of paracetamol. And, you know, we'd have to go around the huge warehouse and after a while, you just knew where everything was, and you just loaded up into a crate and put it to one side with the name of the shop. And then the delivery guy would come and get it and drive it in his little white van and drop it off at that shop. Now, the guy who drove that van was one of the guys who had been lurking around the CCF, the cadet force in the school, and had always sort of been there. And he saw me, and he clearly recognized me. And he was like, I think he thought that he'd been caught out, that actually he wasn't some super important army guy, but he just drove a van for a pharmaceutical warehouse. Oh my god, it's like seeing a teacher yeah. at the supermarket <laughs> yeah. or something in their in their casual clothes with it their really dog was. or whatever. But it's weird like, because Uh-oh. I don't think anybody ever respected him. He was kind of a punchline, but it was just weird these guys. It, like they they weren't at the school. I don't know if they even were at any point. And I just I'd just always been fascinated to find out how had they been cleared to go away for a week with children because nowadays that would never happen in a million fucking years. I would hope Anyone listening well, to this is still at school. Let us know if there are still strange grown-ups that somehow attach themselves to these groups. And, it, uh, yeah, it I, was I'm, mostly, I'm I, I assume, just friends of teachers or someone like that, right? It was. It tended to be a couple of the teachers who were passionate about this. And it, and if the school didn't have a teacher who was a member of the Territorial Army or something, or, or even vaguely interested in it, then they wouldn't have a cadet force often. they just have to sort of, you know, put it to one side. Because it, cause there's... You know, you've only got like how many staff, how many t- t- teachers you got at school? Thirty teachers. Oh, we had loads. Yeah, loads we and did loads. Too. We had big like schools. Always, big, big, so many big crowded schools. I mean, it was a thousand mm. pupils in the school. And there were a lot of teachers. A lot of teachers. I guess. I guess we had. What did we have? So I guess we had like six hundred people. So we we had like a, like we had probably our years were about ninety. Lewis went to Hogwarts. People. So four. <laughs> yeah, it felt maybe maybe a bit more than thirty on on the. Maybe that's why he likes certainly... Harry Potter so much. Maybe his his. We definitely we had education like four houses. was very similar. We he like was educated in like a castle academy by like an old it hermit man with like a beard that, and though. stuff. You know, with the with the with the costumes and the the. Wands. wands lots of wands <laughs> oh my god i was wanded every day multiple times a day it was just uh, relentless yeah my but... poor asshole was what i mean one devastated. of the guys that would come along was the uh, the caretaker i'm pretty sure or at least a mate of the caretaker like sometimes you go to see the caretaker and he, his mate would just be in the the caretaker's office it's like you can't just walk into the school. It's just my, yeah it's just my at, at my primary school we had uh, our caretaker was um like like a fat Elvis impersonator. Like he had <laughs> he had the the hairdo and everything and he used to go like oh, ho 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 like in the hallways and stuff. And like we didn't really know who Elvis was, but we thought it was really funny. But like, you know, he'd just be like mopping or like, you know, fixing a toilet or whatever. And it was always like he always had like his shirt like collar unbuttoned a little bit like too much and he had like like you know these like chains and like an Elvis haircut and stuff. It was really funny actually. 
It's good. I wonder what happened to him. He's probably dead now. I mean, he was old at the time. So <laughs> a, a, a flock of grouse, a flock of grouse just ran past. Nice. No way. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. You're right. You're you're right out there. You are oh, right. We out are. There. Yeah. No, we are. A, f- a flock of grouse. Yeah, like a whole bunch of them. Just they they run along run along on the ground. They run. You remember the chocobo races from Final Fantasy? Yeah. Sure. They they run like chocobo races. That's how they run. They're like that their legs just go like the clappers and they just sort of scuffle along. speaking of final fantasy i went down a bit of a rabbit hole after i got that mini nes did you? i want okay i got the mini nes it has 30 games on it i, I mentioned this last week i really have been enjoying it it's it's nice to just dip in and play some old games and get a blast of nostalgia or whatever but what i found is i'm suffering from the same thing my son suffers from i'll play through a game that i'm very familiar with like and you know i played it a lot as a kid a lot of like the muscle memory hasn't been lost, you know, like I still know how to like do things or whatever. It's it, it's great. But the minute I die, I'm completely just like, I'm done. I don't want to play this anymore. So I switch it off. And then what I do is I go on to YouTube and watch a speed run of the game because I want to <laughs> experience the whole game again. But I don't want to play and then have the inconvenience of dying so I watched somebody do a 100% of, of a game that took me months to finish as a kid in like an hour. Oh, it's amazing. Man, they're really satisfying. I watched like Zelda, like Link, you know, Zelda 2, speed run. It was like an hour, like, you know, the whole game. And it's just like, he's just creaming through these bosses that I remember me and my friends absolutely just screaming at like when we were kids, you know, they were, they were hard. It would took forever to get there. You know, your mom is calling you for dinner. You're like, just a sec, mom, we're the boss again. <laughs> like you, you know, you're like under so much pressure to like, you know, beat this boss and stuff. Just and, save it. Yeah, save it and yeah. play. You can't save it, mom. Yeah. Some you old can. classics. I watched that. I watched uh, Final Fan, the first Final Fantasy game on the NES. I watched a speed run of that. This guy blew my mind. He was just like, he rolled four fighters, you know, the red guys. Like, I never did that. When I was a kid, I had like, you know, a fighter. I had like the ninja. I had like the black wizard and the and the white wizard. Like, you know, just to have hmm. have like a good mix and stuff like that. No, not this guy. Four fighters. Just goes in. He didn't have to farm ogres. You know, he didn't have to buy lots of potions to go in the swamp cave. Nothing like that. This guy just goes in with four fighters. Three of them are dead constantly. But the game is weird because like certain fights where there's multiple bad guys, if you only have one person alive, it'll scale. So like he he got to fights that I remember getting to as a kid where I was like, oh, fuck, I'm dead. There's like 12 bad guys here. He was getting to these fights with one guy alive and there'd only be like two of them. And it was just like it was a cakewalk. He just just blasted through everything. It was awesome. When you when you look back at, at games that subsequently, but like you said, when you played them as a kid and they presented a real challenge and you were pulling your teeth out trying to beat them, and then you watch some grown up come in and min max the shit out of it, it yeah. sucks all the joy. It really does, yeah. But <laughs> as a, as a grown up now, I, really I can appreciate does. it because I just want to see the things that I remember. Like I remember when I first got the airship the first time in Final Fantasy One. I was like crying with joy. I I just thought it was the fucking best thing because mm. the journey to get the stone to then get the airship to come out of the desert was so long. It just took me forever. Like I had Nintendo Power magazines with maps open, everything. Like I was just I was just so into this game. I and I couldn't have been more than 8 years old at the time, around the same age as like my son now. And I just like, even back then, I just remember having all of these, all the resources I could get, you know, like I I told you guys, I phoned my dad's friend at work and stuff for Mm -hmm. like, for tips, but he'd never made it that far anyway. And it just like that, just, just the satisfaction of getting that airship and then being able to like fly around and not bump into enemies and stuff was just incredible. I remember, I remember loving that as a kid. And then I'm watching the speed through and the guy does it. And it was just like, Oh yeah, that was kind oh my of, that was kind of cool, wasn't it? It really was like not not the same, but yeah. I'm still glad to have seen it, sort of thing. But our psychology is so so different. Like yeah, like speedruns are this thing where if you do watch a speedrun of a game, you can't possibly play that game again, right? Because you're like, I'm going to spend 20 hours trying to complete this game, whereas this guy's done it in 15 minutes, and I yeah. know how to do it, and I I'm, I know I'm never going to do it as well as him, or I don't know. Like it's like why why it's like why am I doing this? You know, I kind of kind of is really odd. Speaking of speedruns, there was this thing I played this week, which was interesting, uh, which is kind of the 
this sort of odd horror game that isn't actually it's an accidental horror game which is this um house have you seen this this um house that's for sale in Louis- louisville or somewhere oh i saw it yeah Kentucky there's a house for sale what, what what was up i watched like a little bit of that i saw it, it there was like a room full of what looked like a massive porno collection like a dvd porno collection and and then off to the side of it there was like this walk-in bathtub like what the fuck was that i know so so basically there's this it went a bit viral and there were speed runs on it which is why you reminded me but the whole point of this thing is this is a house for sale in kentucky and it's got this 3d walkthrough because i guess everyone is locked down now but also it's just easy for the guy who's selling it to just set up this 3d camera right around the house and then it generates this 3d walkthrough of the house and then you can just walk around the house like google Maps style right and so um you you don't have to go and tour a house you can buy a house online especially across the country you know imagine in america you want to move to kentucky you don't have to go to kentucky and like fucking look at all these houses or whatever you can just do it online and be like yeah this i think i know what i'm dealing with here there's i can see this mold in the ceiling and there's like the showers like all you know manky and i can see that the garden's fucked you know whatever you know you you know but normally when you get pictures on a house you can't see all the floors right so you have to go there in person and be like oh yeah um do you realize that it's all really small and pokey or the ceilings are really weird or shaped or the floorboards are all manky whatever it's good right anyway there's this horrible house and it's you start off in the sort of in this this sort of lounge area and you could tell there's like you could tell it's weird already because it's first of all it's a shithole it's full of mess it's full of like monster energy cans and like weird things like they've got like multiple, like sometimes you've got three or four TVs in the same room. Wow. Like one of them, like a massive TV on the wall, a massive TV, yeah. like perched on a bed, a massive TV. And it's kind of looks like it's lived in by, I don't know, like three or four crazy homeless people or students. Do you know what I mean? Like really yeah. messy students. And then you sort of gradually sort of explore the rest of this house and you realize that they've got this whole dvd burning like setup going on and they've got where like this warehouse filled with dvds of like every conceivable dvd and it's 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 astonishing then you find that there's this incredibly odd bathroom and that's the that's the point of the game is to discover this bathroom and i encourage you to try it just because it's so weird it only take you like 20 minutes kind of thing that does sound um, weird to look around it's super interesting i don't know how long it's even going to be up you know because it's on like a real estate website right right this fucking, this fucking thing oh someone if will have go- somehow pinched if you it or downloaded google it. it anyway there's like speed runs on youtube to like find the bathtub and it's like 30 seconds long you know because once people know where it is then it's not it doesn't it doesn't need a speed run do you know what I mean for that but it, it's it, that's that's the way that's the world we live in now right it's like these odd speed runs and I, I, so i guess I guess what I'm saying with this house is like, I think it, it turns out that it's actually some, there was some, some sort of illegal activity going on and they all got arrested. Right. And so the house got, you know, seized or whatever and put up for sale. Oh and, my and goodness. And no one's been back. I'm, I'm just looking. Um, so the bathtub is next to 500 Girls Gone Wild DVDs. Yeah, that's, that's right. what I saw as well. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I was that's just... Right. And but it the the fact that you walk down the steps and it's such a oh god that is strange. It's like it like a dunking room or something. It's yeah. like so weird. That's what it is actually because it used to be a chapel that right. Oh, so that right. was the baptism room. Because it's right. got it's got like normally you have a shower head on the wall, but I can see three in this picture. Yeah. three shower yeah. heads. What is going well? I guess on? they could baptize multiple. They got to hose once. down the dirty sinners. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta, they gotta the, wash the sin the right off of their gross, disgusting sinner skin. Yeah, and purify them. Yeah. in, the, in the, the healing light of the Lord. Yeah, they what they do is they get them extra sinned up. They walk through the library of sin, which is uh, what all those girls gone wild DVDs the, in the storage area. <laughs> It's like one yeah. one last um, I, lathering I what, of though, sin, and like, then you get go into the uh, dunking pool of purification. I thought I knew a lot of movies. Okay, I thought I was a pretty pretty clued up right. on movies. And what I learned walking around this warehouse was that I know nothing. Like I think I knew a lot about movies in the nineties when DVDs. I had a lot of time to watch them. But since becoming a dad, I've really lost all of my movie knowledge i like, mean the bear, well, bear in I, mind, i've always been a big movie watcher right, every year i watch so many movies there are a lot of movies that go straight to dvd that aren't worth noticing like they're literally not worth the knowledge but why would you have those on sale if People they're buy so them. shit you'd like, be surprised but they've got boxes and boxes of these like sometimes and what who 
thing is, like the, the stuff about that warehouse as well was that they were still going up until relatively recently because there's some there's some movies that came out this year that are you know they've got DVD rips of, and so they their DVD Blu-ray business was clearly still going strong up until 2020, and I guess maybe I don't know. Like I, I think there's a you're, you're not selling from a shop. Like you don't rely on someone walking in. You're, they're, they're almost certainly selling these online. They're an Amazon. I think they were an Amazon recently. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so people will it. always. There will always be a weird market of people out there who are into some obscure actor or some obscure series right. of movies. I see, and they'll pick up a movie because it's a yeah. reference to them, right? Maybe yeah. like their family or whatever. Or well, they like, just want to collect bad movies. I, 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 have I know a, you I have watch a, a lot of daytime crap pflex you're like a big no TV no as, as we, we've spoken about this previously i do you not love the watch tv movies television. during the day all the time i do not watch week. television i do watch I, movies on tv all the time that's not true i told you at six o'clock till eight o'clock is the only time i watch television because that's okay. when i i so finish two work, hours a day I that's come quite down, a lot that's nothing <laughs> most of that is I'll watch the end of Pointless. If you watch Pointless, that's a good show. Pointless is good. And then show. I'll have a look on Film Four and Sony Movie Classics and everything. If there's an old movie on, I might watch a bit of it. Sometimes I'll record one and I'll watch a film late at night if I'm bored. But honestly, I I, I don't know where this has come from. Lewis, again, that's no, that's all it is. That's enough. That's enough as someone who watches a movie. It sounds like you watch a movie every day. That's quite a lot. No, it's um, not. It's not the case. It's not the case. I, I honestly it's hardly. Dedicated. I'm not saying you're watching them nine hours a day, but no, two but you hours said a day I is still daytime a hobby. TV. Why, it's, Lewis, it's a slur. Why like, aren't you right. watching a movie a day, Lewis? Like what else? What else, like? No, I'm not being funny, but what else do you have to do all day? <laughs> No, honestly, though, you have like a you have like every twelve year old boy's dream job, um, and you have no kids or anything. Like, why aren't you watching a movie a day? You've got more time than anybody. I tr- I, I'm reading books and stuff. Oh. I, I do I do t- I do tend to watch a movie a day actually. So I I am honestly like happy with saying that. I I'm not right. embarrassed about that at all. I but P facts. I know you're a fellow movie watcher, and you're the same age as me. I when I was a kid, I had um I didn't have my parents had the I don't know, the fucking, what was he called? Uh, Roger Ebert or Barry Norman or some assholes. Mega Bible of oh, every yeah, movie. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah, those. Yeah, They're yeah, like a right? phone, it's like a phone book. but It was fucking enormous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, like, any time a movie came on the TV, you'd be able to look it up and he'd be like, two and a half stars. <laughs> James Dean is, plays a really unusual character in this classic 50s movie. Do you know what I mean? It would have everything in there. Um, but then it quickly... Because my parents' version of it was five years out of date when they bought it, as everything was back <laughs> yeah, then. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it didn't really have anything. Kind of, it was, it was, it was kind of. I, honestly, I think one in two movies that I looked up were not in there um, on that were on the TV, and also I spent a lot of time just looking through it, like reading it. It was just one of those casual things we had in the lounge. Yeah, and so I used to up, as well. I'd end up fucking reading this phone book of movies, and so I feel like my knowledge of movies is, if not like. I don't know necessarily what happened in them, but I've usually like felt like I've heard of them maybe. And so I was looking through this warehouse and I didn't fucking recognize any of them. And I was like, but they almost looked they like just all mostly movies pornos, that I though? should know. No, but they were all called things like Among Lick the Leaves. Like a farting ass too. No, they weren't all called <laughs> They weren't all, they, 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 there was only a small porno section. Most of it was just, <laughs> was just those shit movies. Like yeah. just shit movies. Right. Like, One star review, that, that, that very small a, a star who I've never sort of heard of, but I, I sort of vaguely recall that they should be famous. Like, like not Jean-Claude Van Damme, but you know, Andy Van Dam. I'm gonna be like Andy Van Dam. Andy Van Dam. <laughs> Who's that? Alan Van Dam. Do you know what I mean? Like there'd be there'd be people that like that almost sounded. And so I wasn't even sure whether they were real movies or just sort of those fakey, rippy, knockoffy ones. Because you know they have a lot of those, don't they? Every time there's like a disaster movie, they have Armageddon and Deep Impact, and then there's this third one called Meteor, and it's like got some shit ripoff guy. They're yeah. still making these, right? And oh they, yeah, they give they get like one star on IMDb or whatever, and you see them all the fucking time, like on pirate sites and other sites, like like um, and you're like, what the fuck is Amazon, this? Amazon Amazon Prime Video um has lots of those. You, you know, like if you're looking through oh, a category, yeah. and you're just at first, you start looking through a movie category for a genre, and you're like, wow, they've got so much stuff here. It's unbelievable. And you keep scrolling. You're like, I wonder what else they've got. And you keep scrolling. You keep scrolling. And when you start to get to the end of like the legitimate movies, 
they just start serving you up all sorts of garbage, like uh, literally like tons just, of B just movies, like YouTube yeah. movies, <laughs> like YouTube playthroughs. Sometimes, <laughs> like it's just. It's just I don't even know how that stuff gets in there, but yeah, it's funny. So, do, do you guys want to know what board games I've got on offer here in the house and what books? Because I always fascinate when I go. Wait, to before you get into that though, I want to know because I feel like now we need an update on this every week. Have you played any golf while you've been out there? Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, not, not while I'm here, but before we came away. <laughs> oh yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you sounded like a scout oh, leader. Yes, yeah. like a, yes. Uh, yes I'm so I, pleased you asked. I, oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am pleased you asked. It was, it was on the Sunday before we came away. I played, or the Saturday, sorry. I played in the, uh, the Academy Tournament. Wow. Which is for, oh, oh, wow. for new players. I'd like to thank the Academy for letting me play in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> this is a change oh. because last week you could, you, when you're having an existential crisis, you couldn't hit the ball. Well, that, that's, you're how having one of those, that's how it those goes. Those tin cup moments where yes. you like, doubted yourself at the end of the movie, but you just had to get your swing back. It's true. So I, I went to the driving range and um, I hit about 100 balls. And I, I found that the, the driver, and I spoke to some friends of mine about this, I, I still struggle with the driver. I think I need a special lesson just with the driver. But with most of the other clubs, including the hybrid, golfers will know what I'm talking about. No problem. I'm, I'm hitting it reasonably well. Right. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a format called Texas Scramble. And what happens is you're a team and you all hit the ball from the tee. And then whatever the best shot is, you all take the next shot from there. And then whatever the best shot of your three is, you take the next shot from there. So it's a team effort to try and get a low score to beat the other teams. And so I didn't feel so bad because I knew that if I shanked it horribly into the water, it doesn't matter because one of my teammates will have hit a decent shot. Right, so we, right. played, we played nine holes and I'm, I'm not even, I'm not kidding. The, 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 the second hole that we played was beautiful. It was a beautiful team effort. We did it in three shots. It was a par three. We did it in three. And I hit the tee shot and it was absolutely fucking glorious it was the best shot i've ever hit straight as an arrow landed just short of the green the next guy came up chipped it right near the hole the other guy putted it i was like lads that was an awesome team effort right. we were really happy um i did hit a couple of stickers but on the whole it was actually pretty good like i was hitting so it they, they well. were able to make up for your lower skill level by like was it fixing your problems is that, is that how it works? Like if you fucked it up, they could fix your, you know, they could do the, the putting and the chipping and right. you could do the driving. But but it was, there was one of the, one of the three of us was very experienced. He was really good. And the other guy was similar to me. He'd been playing a little bit longer than me. He was this big German dude, a little, little older and um, he'd retired. So he was probably in his, in his, I'd say late fifties, early sixties. And he had very, very fancy clubs. I'll say that. And his, his sort of driving everything, he, he was not dissimilar to me. He hit some very nice, shots with the the five and the six iron really really nice but again he struggled with the driver as well and i, I would honestly say that our performances were not so dissimilar that i was like oh this is fucking hopeless like it was actually pretty close um so yeah it was really good we were really it was a really positive atmosphere if you hit a good shot everyone was like wow, that was fantastic it, it just felt really good and i was like this did you is guys what? like when you guys were done did you guys like go have like a like a steam sauna together and slap each other's butts with your hands and towels like flick towels at each other and stuff or is that not really Sad, a golf thing? sadly not that's sadly more like not. a baseball thing i think after a good <laughs> yeah. game of baseball <laughs> Yeah. yeah, head down to the dugout. Get down, get down in the dugout. Just, just, just get nude and just fucking have a steam and just, just stare at each other's Johnsons and, just, and stuff. Like, whatever. It's just, you know, it's just, just a fucking tough game. Yeah. You know, you got to relax somehow. Yeah, just just lean in and if they kiss, <laughs> just kiss lean back, in. Just keep kissing. Just, <laughs> just go just, with just, it. Just do a little, just do a just little lean bit in and of, see if they kiss you. Yeah, just, just, you know, yeah. sit, sit, because you never sit know. next they to each other really close. Idea. Just see what happens. Just got to try if they move back, then you know you just you know you just pretend it was like nothing, and they just carry on being yeah. friends and just laugh it out. Just laugh it out. Yeah. Just. I'm just um, fucking so with any, you. <laughs> it's just sounds, joking. <laughs> just mm, come here. <laughs> uh, so so uh, so imagine people. Like, it, it feels to me like what you've played there isn't golf, but a kind of novelty kind of golf fun. Yeah. Fun. Day. I want to say as well, what's with this nine hole bullshit? Like, why, when when are you going to man up and don't be such a puss and do a full eighteen like a big boy? Can I just say, neither of you's ever hit a fucking golf ball in your life. So no, I have. Lewis has seen me actually. I've got good form. Oh really? He's he's got really solid form. Oh yeah, man, he's like a he's like a swan. 
I'd yeah. say, like the long neck, yeah. just like, like swinging a swan, Swans don't have arms, so looking forward to seeing like that. A, I imagine a swan with really buff arms. I tell you guys about a nice day that I had, <laughs> and you want me to turn it into a gay sauna session, <laughs> and now you're flaming it. I don't think you really played golf. No, no, no. no. I'm just, we're just fucking fuck with you. Up, we're just fucking with you. Now, come on, let's asshole. kiss. This sounds really healthy. Um, I'm glad you're meeting uh, friends. Don't back up now. I'm going to tell you about the shitty board games. Get I'm done a good with time. Golf. Well, <laughs> trivial, trivial Pursuit Master Edition. Obviously, that's there. Oh, that's good. That's hang a good on a second. One. Hang on. Hang on a second. So, I went to a coffee shop this week, and they had a whole row of books. And I should have taken a picture if I knew we were going to fucking talk about this because I, I noticed how shit they were. Um, <laughs> it was, it was one of these take one, leave one situations. And so, what happened was a load of militant vegans had obviously been in and fucking <laughs> taken all the good books and left like why animals can feel pain and stuff like this. You know what I mean? On the fucking whole, the whole wall was like very, I'm, I'm obviously a vegan, you know, yeah. so I, I'm, I'm, but I'm not, I'm not like that kind of thing. I, you know, I if I'm a, sitting in a coffee shop, I don't want to read about animal cruelty no, or see well, yeah, like but I mean, pictures of pigs suffering in the corner of my eye. I just want to sit there and read my coffee and maybe look at, I don't know, a picture of balloons in Bristol or something. Do you know what I mean? I, or like, I've got uh, one here for you guys on that topic. I've got one here. All right. What do you think of this, Lewis? As a vegan yourself, I'm, I'm not a vegan for the record, but, but still, I, I wonder what you. you think of this, okay? I'll get you one day. Okay. Yeah, go on. Um, Burger King, right? You know, sure. Burger King. Um, they have a, a vegan burger now that you can get. Yes. Do you think that a vegan should be eating a vegan burger from Burger King? Um, why why not it's it's the way forward isn't it it's like you've got to start somewhere but i think burger king have probably made enough money off of slaughtering animals and you know putting them into gigantic batteries and mistreating them and stuff over the decades that it's been going for to not need your support to go totally vegan right but like i don't don't you feel like if you're giving them money you're just like kind of supporting shitty May um, I may I speak on that very stuff? briefly? I know I'm not. A, yeah. I don't. I know I don't have. No, it's a, nice to have the three perspectives here. I, I, I don't. I don't friends. have an or in this fight because um, I'm not a vegan, um, but or a vegetarian. But I, I suppose that if if we if we look at the the history of companies and say you guys have done bad things, so we're never going to let you do good things because of it then there's no motivation for companies to change. And that surely has to be something that people want. But they're still doing these things. They haven't right. just gone completely vegan. They're still doing right. these shitty things alongside trying to make money off of vegans as well. Ooh, and well, right. I, just, the thing, the thing, I just don't think that people should be supporting them with that, especially vegans who should be about thing, more than Sips, that, right? We live in a capitalist society, right? And it's all about money, okay? I'm very hopeful that it costs them Sure, it costs them a quid to make a patty that's you know cruelty, f- cruelty full. But it probably costs them ten p to make the vegan patty because it's fucking made. And of they'll tofu. sell it, but the market and the, they'll double the price, right? Yeah, of so course. The profit they will. margin on those ones push through. If they can make it taste better and you know and and be be less gristly and gross and you know less guilt filled. Oh, here's a lovely, delicious, cruelty full guilt. F- filled burger mm, would yeah you like, i just would i like just an it's just an, it's just an interesting it's just an interesting thing right like i just think it's i just think it's it i, I just i don't know like it feels like maybe i think money's the only thing that's going to change and i think that that them learning this you know that these these burgers will sell and will make them more money is the way to 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 move towards a yeah. better i feel like it's system. another it's another trap for vegans in a lot of in a lot I, of ways I, I also think if you look at large companies like bp and, and shell and all these oil companies and energy companies that have been polluting for for years oil spills and and all the gases and everything that's contributing to, to climate change and everything. If we don't allow those companies to also do things that we support, then they'll just spend all that money lobbying against all the good stuff. That's it. So you either yeah. offer them an in. Like yeah. it, it, I, I understand what you're saying completely. Yes. Yeah. Why should I just, we allow? It's just an interesting shower thought, really. Right. Like no, it no, just I, I get didn't it. Make sense yeah, to it me. is a really interesting. It's really interesting. I think I think that you're right about that as well. Like you know, why should we allow? you know, someone who's historically been so terrible to suddenly, you know, get, get, cause, cause you could see how it would work, right? People, vegans would come along and bring up their other yeah. meat eating friends and it I might mean, if end up to be more meat burgers be sold. You know, you never yeah. know. If like, you're talking might, about exactly reform, you're like it's not, you know, like, like reform in a traditional sense, like a prisoner comes out of prison 
and uh, is is a better person. But they're not just still doing crimes on the side, right? Because then they're not really reformed. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, it's true. It's, it's kind of the same. Right. But it's not. I mean, it's not. It's an extreme. Yeah. No, um, I, I get what you're saying. But I, yeah. I, I think the problem is, is if we deny these companies the chance to make money from something that is essentially positive, and I say that is a, as a, a, for all the reasons you guys point out about cruelty to animals and the, the pollution that it causes, like mass farming is bad for the environment, all this stuff. I get it. If we say to all these large companies that are in place, already have the funds, already have the geography in terms of the real estate and everything, if we say to them, no, you guys are still bad, I think it's a terrible tactical move on the part of a progressive concept. And I, I uh, you see it all the time. I'm happy enough for them to just fade away. They've had their time. Maybe somebody they, else's they won't. turn. They won't. But, but, but the only language any corporation says is money. That's, yeah, that's the course. only thing, because that's what we are driven. That's how the free market works and how everything works and how we've built this amazing society, which we're incredibly lucky to have today. You know, yeah. we wouldn't have had it. And it's true to say that we wouldn't be if we had a communist society you know it wouldn't it wouldn't be as rich and and productive as it is at the moment and i think that that you know that, but but obviously unrestrained capitalism is is probably bad yeah and and it needs to be taxed you know we need to just make sure we put make it more expensive for companies to cause pollution yeah sure they're welcome to do it but we want them to, you know, I'd rather, this way we have to have the subsidies and the tax incentives in the right places. I think a lot of the time they're not because they're historically set up to support, you know, the coal miners or, you know, the, the lob, the lobbyists, like you said, P flex. It's a very, it's a very kind of. I just, I just think a lot of the, a lot to, of these progressive ideas like environmentalism and, and animal rights and everything, they, they, they want to sell the entire picture and you have to accept it all right now, wholesale and make total change or it's a failure. And this is going to be a gradual change. In some cases, we need it to be slightly less gradual and a bit more accelerated. But if we don't go in tactically and say, all right, we have to let these companies that are historically the bad guy in and hope that they are agents for change as well. If we don't do that, then what's the fucking point? You're going to lose. You're going to have a bunch it's of tough. A it, bunch this of sandal really wearing, tough thing. tofu eating hippies are going to change the world. No, unfortunately, we're going to have to rely on mega corporations to do it. And you have to hope that they get on the same page. That's my yeah. Well, well, the only way you can control doomed. them is with money. That's <laughs> the, all they yeah, care exactly. about. Yeah, exactly. We're doomed. We're doomed. Uh, so though it's not. So I talked to old um, Simon Clark this week because we have the same birthday, and he came down and we had a chat and we had a, we had a pie minster together. Oh, nice. I had a, I had a, a vegan. Is he a, is he a vegetarian as pie? well? Old Clarky. Old suck he up is, clock, yeah. he's sucking your dick he about is. your birthday. Vegan or vegetarian? I think he's trying to be vegan, but I think he's he likes cheese too much or something like that. God, so God, God bless him. God bless him. Way to... God bless that cheese eating man. But he t- he's re- he's writing a book currently. Oh, nice. Um, which is it's, it's, it's a big project for him. Is it called sort of, How Lewis Brindley is Amazing and Why I Love It? Yeah. Part one. No, because he's a, he's a climate scientist. I know, isn't he? I know, so, I know. Uh, yeah, by the way, never read the YouTube comments on his videos. Never oh, read them. Are it's, they, are why? they f- because, full of deniers? Oh my God. And it's it, like, I feel like, obviously, it's, you know, Dr. Simon Clark, is, is, he's a smart guy. And the tendency when someone goes at someone who's like academic and smart with an absolute falsehood is to respond to them and to try to argue them around to your way of thinking. And it just never works because these idiots have their head in the sand. They don't want to know, don't want to hear about facts. They just want to hear the propaganda that they've had bled into their brains. Why? Where, like, where are, who are these people? Like, where? And I what? know. How do these people exist? Like, it's, I'm it's, stunned. It, because it's it been blows because my it's mind. because it's been politicized. Right. Or like all I these issues I, have been politicized. And so, I assume everyone must know someone like this. But yeah. I've managed to sort of I've managed to sort of slowly work those people out of my life. <laughs> So I yeah, I mean, I, I know you guys fairly well, but I'm like, but do you guys have any sort of like guilty, hidden beliefs that you've never like really shared with anyone, but I'm like sure. go against, sure. go against Absolutely. the grain a bit? Like, yeah, can you yeah. think of any? Yeah, yeah not, none that I'm going to share, but yes. Yeah, I'm not going to share my hidden uh, bigotry. <laughs> I don't know if I actually have Jeremy. any. Like the things that I think about, I usually talk to either my stream or like you guys about like i don't think i really have anything 
overly sort of... I, 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 well, I pride myself on being willing to change. And I have seen over the last 10 years sort of ideas that I previously had been converted one way or another. Not necessarily anything too serious. You know, I, I used to believe that 9-11 was a hoax. You uh, no, didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. But uh, I, 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 a friend of mine did. Like, really, we, we had a chat. I never, I never believed that it was a hoax, but I was interested enough to... To, yeah, to watch I, I like documentaries about it or whatever, because it just just a different perspective. No, it's not a different perspective. That's the problem. It's like saying it's like these giving these flat earthers. It's just a different perspective. It's I not. mean, even that though. Like, I'm interested to see what makes them tick. I don't well, agree I'm, I'm with it at all, but I'm I would I would happily fascinated. watch somebody. Explain. We're all fascinated. Yeah, yeah with, I, do, with I think it's just managed to. I think it's interesting. I, I, I hope that I am willing to, um, as I. You know, I think sometimes you don't even necessarily realize you have a prejudice until someone calls you on it or until it affects you in some way. Because sometimes, you know, these beliefs are never are never a problem. You know, if you if you grew up, I don't know, in some rural hick town in America where you were all racists and then you never met a black person, then you never you've never really had to confront that inbuilt prejudice that that community has given you or whatever. Do you know what I mean over the course of that time? Yeah. So I, I, I think until you're confronted with these things, sometimes you real you so it's like a little bit like when you're a kid, you're taught, I don't know, like a, a handbag, like is a handbag or whatever. And you go through life thinking, oh, it's a handbag and no one calls you on it. It's like, it's like, <laughs> and so for your whole life, you're like, oh, it's, it's a handbag, not a handbag. I've been saying it wrong all this time. Like I, I sometimes find stuff like that that I've done wrong or like I've pronounced Bunos Aries wrong my whole life or something <laughs> yeah. like this. Do you know what I mean? Like you stuff pronounce like pronounce Bunos just, Aries wrong. I you're still an pronounce idiot. it. I still pronounce it like that. It's just this thing that we've always done. I don't know. And, and so everyone always finds these things. Like the classic ones are Harry Potter, like people doing Hagrid and Hermione or whatever. Um, those are like oh, two yeah, that's things. Oh, yeah, that's a classic, that, yeah. That's but, not but a like classic. The, there's good examples, of, there's good examples of, of egg corns like that, where people have thought an acorn is an egg corn. Um, I mean, but I a, suppose for, when, it, when it comes to attitudes, like there are certain words, if your parents call them egg corns, you're going to think they're called egg corns and that's how you're going to grow up. And interestingly enough, we were watching telly the other day. It was Channel 4 News. I stuck it on. And there was a, a woman on there uh, talking about um, the slave trade. And my eldest was like, well, what does she mean, the slave trade? And I, I, because they haven't covered it in school yet. And I was talking to her about the, the transatlantic slave trade and the history of slavery in America and all that kind of stuff. And, and she asked a question. She said, why are they racist? And I was like, well, that's a very difficult question. And she said, well, right, well why aren't we racist? And I think that's a really interesting question is why... Why aren't I racist and some people are? And I said, well, imagine if we'd been, if me and mummy were deeply racist. Um, I, let's say we hated black people. Let's say that that was our racism. And we brought you up in that mold. You would be a racist. Like, that's just the way it goes. And I think it's interesting that we essentially see all racists as that they've made an active decision. But just yeah. like you said, Lewis, they might have actively <laughs> just grown up around other racists, and that's the culture. How yeah. do you break that down is very, very difficult. And I, I think uh, yeah. a lot I think of it coming is coming to ter yeah, and uh, an understanding that 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 it's the same thing with me. And I know I'm a lot of people are religious out there, and I don't want to shit on their their beliefs and stuff. But I, I realize that you know, if you happen to be born in India, you'll probably be. Uh, a Sikh or a Hindu, like, or, or a Muslim. And, you know, and according to where you were born, and you certainly wouldn't be a Christian. Uh, well, maybe you would in certain places. Yeah, but no, it's there's, like, there's a little bit over there, for and sure. So, yeah, but again, so actually, like, it, birth, it felt to me right? like just by virtue of luck and family, suddenly you luckily were the correct, in the correct God area, and you had the right beliefs. And I, I felt like that was so, so to me, so ludicrous. There's that, definitely a period in your life where you you sort of look back on on your upbringing and and question some of the that, morals and, and values. That's so that important, isn't it? Is when it, you get to that age where you suddenly have yeah. your own thoughts and your own assessment and your reflection but I think, of things yeah, you believe. I think what helps with that is it, it, the difference with that is like like I have I've had moments like that where I've, I sort of got to a certain age. I looked back at how I was raised and I thought, I'm, I'm not sure about that or that or that. But I've had the space to think like that too, right. because I live very far away from my parents. I don't see them every day. I don't you know, even talk and to also, them. Every day. You know what and also makes a big difference? Deciding deciding that those if those for those values and those feelings are not are, are, are and you can decide. You know, if you 
went against the community. That's a problem. If everyone else in your village is racist and your family is racist and your uncle's racist and your people who look after your kids and the people who teach your kids are all racist, sometimes it's easy just to be like, okay, I guess I'm just not going to say anything. Right, but Even also... Though, I but mean, also, I feel like in the 90s, like there's there uh, elements of that of uh, homophobia, right? Like uh, like lots of media and stuff. I mean, it was, it was very common for us to call everything gay and use it as like a, an insult, right? Like you're fucking gay or whatever. And that was just... That was just how it was done back then. Was I actually homophobic? I don't think I was. I, I, I don't actually think I was. I don't think I, I, I thought about it in those terms. It was just um, it was just vocabulary at the time that was popularized through shows that we were watching, TV, and 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 just the schoolyard stuff as well. Yeah, like, like teen culture. I, I don't think that everybody I grew up with was a homophobe. At, by but in any the same means. way, there was a lot of even recently, you know, like like the you know with people using um, you know some of the early seasons of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, full of like transphobic stuff yeah. and like kind of using the arsler and stuff like this, like stuff that is not you know that's recent. That's like that's yeah. very quick to change. Like, you but know, don't, don't you think that, was, that the 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 biggest motivator to to have you reassess your beliefs is is talking to other people. That, yeah, it's realizing the your, impact that it has where you didn't re, where you didn't think before that before there was people any. before people lose their mind about always sunny. I know that they're bad people and that that's part of it, right? And that yeah, they're, yeah. they're they're people you shouldn't emulate. No, and that's no. why they're these terrible people. And yeah. so it's used in a context that's okay. But I think that even so, like watching it now is is tricky. Um, but that's this be, is why yeah. I, I think when people. When people from a small sort of community that doesn't really have much uh, sort of exposure to other uh, opinions gets solidified, is you know when you, the, the famous idea of the, the the kid going off to university and coming back with crazy ideas like that's a real thing. Like you you go away yeah. to university, you have your ideas challenged because you meet up with people from all over the world, all over the country, from different backgrounds and cultures, and you have your beliefs challenged. You have those arguments at three in the morning when you're all high. And it makes you think, even if you don't change at that moment, it makes you think about some of the ideas that you've got. And over time, I think it changes people. My family just came back, so I'm going to have to call it a day there. Lads. All right, that's good. Right, thank enjoy the rest of your you. um, your retreat. Enjoy flex. your holiday. Holy crap. Yeah, have a nice rest of your time. I hope it goes better than it has been by the sounds of it. But um, I'm sure we'll know. have a wonderful... We're going out for a pub lunch, so I'm sure that's going to be Oh, there you thank go. Thank you for joining us. There you go. Oh, my pleasure. Have a, have a Burger King vegan burger <laughs> on us. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have some locally sourced pork for lunch. <laughs> nice. Yark. It's a sheep. The island of Sheppy. you got to have lamb. No, yeah. no. Yeah. There are lots of sheep, but I'm not going to have lamb. It's uh, it's eat it's their too balls. Late just pork. fucking devour eat those balls. <laughs> just eat those golf. <laughs> eat that guy's golf balls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 bye, 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 bye. bye.